Um, for, we'll just turn it over to Mr. Williams uh, from House Research. Chair Gomez and members, for the record, I'm Sean Williams from House Research. Um, Chair Gomez asked me today to discuss the tax treatment of Social Security under current Minnesota law, um, walk through the federal exclusion, the state subtraction, give some data on the, the tax treatment under current law, and then talk a little bit about the history of uh, how the federal exclusion came to be and how that sort of compares to other kinds of retirement income. Um, so under current law, there's two policies that lead to Social Security being partly taxed in Minnesota. There's a federal exclusion that we adopt because the starting point for our state income tax is adjusted gross income. There's also a separate state subtraction that taxpayers are allowed for any portion of benefits that are taxable federally. I'm gonna start by discussing the federal exclusion. So for all taxpayers under federal law, between 15 and 100% of social security benefits are non-taxable federally. If you look at the table on this slide in front of you, um, there's three, there's two sort of two tiers um, uh, that determine how much of your income is subject to tax. For married couples filing joint returns, it's uh, the first tier starts at $32,000 of provisional income. Uh, that's an income definition you may not be familiar with that I'll be discussing later, but I think it's easier to sort of set that aside for now. Um, uh, the, uh, starting at from, from $32,000 to uh, $44,000 for married couples, 50% of income is excluded. And then for taxpayers with provisional income above $44,000, um, the exclusion is 15%. So depending on where your provisional income falls, it also depends sort of how your other kinds of income and social security income stack. That determines what your federal exclusion is. Minnesota also has a state subtraction um, that allows taxpayers to subtract a portion of their federally taxable benefits. For married uh, couples filing joint returns, that's $5,840. And for single and head of household taxpayers, it's $4,560. The subtraction is phased out, beginning at $88,630 of provisional income for joint returns and $69,250 for single and head of household taxpayers. It's fully phased out at about $117,000 for married joint returns and about $92,000 for single and head of household filers. That subtraction is forecasted to reduce revenues by $92.6 million in tax year 2023. Uh, under current law, the Department of Revenue's uh, forecast is that 362,900 returns would receive an average tax benefit of $255. I wanted to bring your attention um, on the House Research website. This is more for sort of your benefit at a future time. Um, we have a calculator tool where you can input example taxpayers, the amount of Social Security income that they might have, and the amount of other kinds of income they, may, they might have. And it will show you um, sort of how, uh, what their tax treatment would be if Minnesota did not have that state subtraction, and also what their tax treatment would be uh, under the full Social Security exemption proposal. And um, this is a graph that sort of shows how these two uh, st uh, state and federal exclusions interact with one another. So the, the blue area on the left is sort of uh, non, is, is the federal exclusion. So you can see uh, up to about, it, uh, and this is for a married couple filing a joint return, it's uh, between $25,000 and $50,000. Um, the federal ex exclusion covers 100% uh, of taxable income. That's because of that first exclusion tier that I discussed for the federal exclusion. The state subtraction begins to kick in as the federal, as more income gets subject to tax federally, so it keeps a few more people from paying any tax on their Social Security income. And then you can see how it phases out there. So sort of as income goes up, you see that green wedge in the top right of this graph. That sort of shows you how the amount of benefits that are subject to tax changes with income. Uh, no one likes talking about income definitions, but I think it's helpful here just to mention that um, provisional income is a very kind of esoteric term. Um, it's a federal income definition that's used to calculate how much of your Social Security is subject to federal tax. It starts with modified adjusted gross income. So for many taxpayers, it can be broader than adjusted gross income. Uh, for example, it includes non-taxable interest. Um, it can also be lower for taxpayers that have Social Security income in some cases because you always include 50% of your Social Security benefits in provisional income. So if, if for example, you are one of those taxpayers that gets 100% exclusion federally, then you would add back half of your benefits to calculate provisional income. So it, it's a little bit confusing in this context because it can be both greater and lesser than your adjusted gross income, sort of depending on your unique situation. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to maybe walk through uh, at a high level, like the, the Social Security income in Minnesota and sort of what, where it all falls out in the different steps of this process. So I, I pulled some data from the Social Security Administration for 2020. Um, it shows that there's about $19 billion of OASDI, that's Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance Benefits, in Minnesota in that year. And this is for 2020, because it's the most recent data available from the Department of Revenue. Um, 
In the Department of Revenue's sample of 2020 resident tax returns, there's about $14.9 billion of Social Security income. And that's because about $4.3 billion of income is represented among people who did not file a return. So they did not have a state liability, did not have a state filing requirement. So that's about 22% of the, uh, the total benefits in the state. Um, as you can see in this table here, the, the federal exclusion causes another 7.7 .7 or so billion dollars of Social Security income to be excluded. Um, and that gets you to your federally taxable benefits. So it's about 7.3 billion in federally taxable benefits. The Minnesota subtraction takes off another $1.3 billion in uh, benefits. And that leaves another $6 billion or so of potentially taxable benefits, is how I'm calling them. But among the returns that have potentially taxable benefits, that's returns where the federal exclusion and the state subtraction don't exclude the full amount of their benefits, there's another group of returns that just had no state liability. So their liability could have been wiped out by the standard deduction or um, a tax credit of some sort. So. Um, this gets to about 5.9 billion, or about 30% of all 31% of all benefits are subject to tax in Minnesota. This is a similar sort of analysis, but instead of talking about the benefits, it's talking about um, households or individuals that pay that have Social Security benefits. So, um, I pulled a similar number from the uh, Social Security Administration. There's about uh, 1 billion, 1.1 billion individuals in Minnesota receiving Social Security benefits in December 2020. Um, and if you look at the, the tax sample that I mentioned, there's about 597 resident returns that had some Social Security income. Um, one difficulty in making that comparison is that tax returns uh, can represent one or two people potentially with benefits because you can file a joint return. And so um, the Social Security Administration has some data. Uh, they estimate that about 28% of households receiving Social Security do not file a return. Uh, and that's because they don't have tax liability. Either their income is, their social security is non-taxable, their income is wiped out by the standard deduction. And so um, using that number, I sort of have an estimate here of 829 households that have, or tax households that have social security benefits. Um, so about 150,000 of those get the 100% federal exclusion. So that leaves you with about 447,000 returns that have social security that's taxable federally. Our existing state subtraction uh, wipes out their taxable security, social security for about 82,000 returns. So that leaves us with about 365,000 that have potentially taxable social security income. Again, there's about 2% of those returns that just don't have any state liability. So probably the standard deduction or a, another credit wipes out their liability. And we're left with about 348,000 households in Minnesota paying uh, tax on their social security benefits. And that's, uh, if you take that as a percentage of that 829,000 number, that's about 42% of households that receive social security. Um, this next slide shows sort of a distributional analysis. This is an analysis of the sort of remainder. So it's the amount left over after the federal exclusion and after the state subtraction. So you can see here, um, sort of as you move up the income spectrum, there's sort of more benefits taxable um, uh, as a percentage, uh, or it, and that's just a fu function of the uh, federal exclusion and the state subtraction being phased out. So a big chunk of uh, the total benefits is, I'd say, between 50 and $150,000. There's over 20% of total benefits in each of those, uh, you know, income ranges. The second column, or the second, the middle two columns show the share of resident returns. So these are resident returns paying Social Security tax, and again, it's it's falling. Um, you know, in the $25,000 to $100,000 range, uh, or I'd say 250 is uh, sort of the biggest groups there. So again, you get, um, those are the returns that sort of still pay tax on their social security benefits. And um, on the right, I have percentages, I show, show, show you there the sort of total number of returns that have any social security income. And again, you can sort of see, um, as the uh, federal and state subtractions phase out on the far right, you can see sort of more and more returns are paying at least some tax on their benefits as those uh, existing exclusions phase out. Last, uh, Representative Gomez asked me to talk a little bit about sort of how Social Security income compares with other sorts of retirement income. This is kind of a simplification, but I think it might be a helpful way to think about all of this. Um, there's sort of three kind of regimes for taxing retirement benefits. There's sort of what you might call a traditional IRA, 401k, where your contributions to the account are made pre-tax, um, so they're deductible, and then your distributions in retirement are taxable, and that's to sort of avoid double taxation. So it's, it's taxed on one side, not the other. Uh, a Roth style account is sort of the inverse of that, where your contributions are made after tax, but the distributions in retirement are tax free. There's a third kind of less well known, I think, system of taxing retirement benefits that applies to uh, pensions. Um, it, it's sort of, some pensions plans use the same structure as traditional or Roth IRAs, but um, there's others that ha are sort of partly taxable. And the idea here is that a portion of the contributions were made pre-tax and a portion were made after tax. So as a result, 
portion of the benefits would also be uh, subject to tax, uh, but a portion was not. And um, again, this is a simplification, but you know, there's, there's sort of three sources of income or financing for Social Security. Um, there's employee contributions, which are made after tax, so you can't deduct the, the, the FICA taxes you have withdrawn for Social Security from your income. Um, there's employer contributions that are pre-tax contributions. They're deductible to the employer. And then there's also interest earned on Social Security Trust Fund uh, on Treasury securities purchased. And for self-employed individuals, this sort of same partially tax, uh, deductible treatment applies to your payroll contributions. So you, if you're self-employed, you can deduct 50% of the payroll taxes you've paid because you're also, um, in that case, paying both the employer and the employee side of the payroll tax. <coughs> Last slide uh, talks about the sort of changes to 19, the Social Security that were made in 1993. So 1993 was the year that the 85% tier, that third tier from the first slide, was added to the federal Social Security exclusion. Um, the, fe the federal exemption was designed to sort of mimic this third treatment I just discussed of pension income, where contributions are partially taxable and benefits are also partially taxable. Um, I have a quote here on the slide. I won't read the whole thing from the House Budget Committee, but you know, this was, uh, they, they produced a report describing what their intent was with this, and they said, the committee desires to more closely conform the income tax treatment of Social Security benefits and private pension benefits. So that, that's sort of what's motivating all of this. So in 1993, the Social Security actuary did a study to estimate if we applied sort of similar pension tax rules to Social Security that we apply to other pensions, what it, sort of is the ratio of taxes paid by the individual to benefits received? And they found that the average uh, ratio was about 4 to 5% in 1993. The actuary also estimated that the highest possible ratio of taxes paid to benefits received was 15%. And that was for single highly paid males. And the reason is that single highly paid males don't have survivor benefits. Um, males tend to have shorter lifespans than women. And because they're highly paid, they probably paid more in payroll taxes. And for those individuals, it's about 15% was the ratio of payroll taxes paid to benefits out on the back end. And so Congress decided that they could uh, subject up to 85% of benefits to taxation yeah, exactly. without imposing double tax. The confusing thing that's hard for sort of the conversation now is that there's no updated analysis of this. We don't know what the ratio is sort of the high end for benefits, uh, taxes paid to benefits received. So it's unclear to the extent that anyone under current law is pay, being you know, partially double taxed on a portion of their contribution. Uh, the Social Security Administration does say on their website that almost all beneficiaries still enjoy mo more favorable tax treatment for their benefits than is the case for private pensions. And that's because we have these 50% and 100% exclusion tiers in Social Security tax. And so um, that's sort of the lay of the land on you know, how these are treated relative to uh, other types of retirement income. Um, and that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions if the committee has them. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Is everybody ready for their quiz on provisional income, double taxation? Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just uh, wondered if um, if you could follow up on that final comment about the comparison of, of taxation of Social Security benefits as opposed to the taxation of, of private um, pension benefits. Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Gomez, Representative Pinto, uh, I guess, uh, do you have a specific question or do you want just maybe a little bit more clarity on that? A little that, more, yeah. You know, I think one way to describe it is in 1993, the Social Security Administration said what the highest sort of amount of taxes paid in to benefits received. And they thought in 1993, based on an actuarial study, that was 15%. And so they set this federal uh, exclusion at at least 15% for everyone. We don't really have sort of an up-to-date analysis. And for private pension plans, uh, this is on the very bleeding edge of what I understand, but uh, I think that the plan administrator works with the IRS to sort of determine what the ratio of your, ta your sort of um, after-tax contributions in are to benefits received and calculates a specific ratio for those pensions. And so we don't really have sort of a similar analysis for Social Security. So it's hard to do sort of an apples to apples comparison there. I, does it hopefully answer your question or provide some extra clarity? Maybe just Representative Pinto. Just quickly, Madam Chair, I guess um, I, I sort of heard you at the end saying it's tough to make the apples to apples comparison, but then I'd heard you before saying that there is reason to believe, though, that there is more favorable treatment for private pensions. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just if you could just help me understand what would cause it to be more favorably or how, how to think about that. Mr. Williams, and could I ask you to just lean a little closer to your mic? I think some folks in the back are having trouble hearing. Thank you. Uh, Chair Gomez and members, my apologies. Um, I, I think it's hard to make an apples to apples comparison. I think that you can, uh, I think the Social Security's assertion is that 
because we have these 50% and 100% exclusion tiers, there's a lot of people that are getting a more favorable treatment on Social Security than they might get on a comparable pension. However, the question is, are there people that have paid a very high amount of tax in relative to benefits received? And are there any of those people who paid in more tax than 15% uh, than of what they're receiving in benefits that might be subject to double taxation? And we just don't have actuarial data from the Social Security Administration on that second question. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, um, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and I'll be I'll be quick. So just kind of as a follow up question to you, um, so under current law, about three hundred and fifty thousand um, uh, seniors are cu currently subject to the Social Security tax, um, approximately. Would you say, Mr. Williams? Uh, Chair Gomez and Representative Swidzinski, I think yeah, that's I think it's three forty nine ish. So, um, so, okay, and it's on. If you give me a moment, it's eight. on slide. Okay. <coughs> slide eight. Maybe. Yep, slide eight. So, uh, yeah, 348,700. Representative Swidzinski. Sounds good. Thank you, Madam Chair. And does that 340,000 already include folks that are um, currently paying, or, or that's under current law? So, it's, so above that, we would estimate that there's another 80,000 folks that would potentially, if we didn't, if we did tax Social Security from dollar one, it would be, you know, another 80,000 on top of that. So about 430,000 uh, folks on Social Security. Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Gomez and Representative Spazinski, if you look at the, the table on page of these slides, there's 597 resident returns yep. um, okay. with Social Security income of any kind. Um, and then there's an additional, I'm estimating here, but 200,000 or so returns that don't have a filing requirement. It's kind of hard to know how many, I mean, returns are not individuals, so returns might represent two people in some cases, so that makes it a little bit harder. And gotcha. then the other, the other hard part of this is if we taxed, you know, Social Security from dollar one, potentially some of those individuals who have no filing requirement might, might have a filing requirement. Gotcha. But, um, you know, I, looking at a sample of tax returns, it's about 597,000. People who filed return or people who filed returns, 597,000 returns in tax year 2020 that had at least some Social Security income. All right. Representative Swidzinski. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and thank you again. You know, so just just so it's about 349,000 individuals currently paying Social Security tax in Minnesota. So I think you know, just at, at, as we're hearing these bills, I appreciate that we're hearing these bills. We have to make the dis discussion: who's going to spend that money better? Either the 349,000 individuals that are currently paying taxes on Social Security or the two, 201 legislators in Minnesota. That's, at the end of the day, who's going to have to make that choice? Is it the 201 elected officials in St. Paul that's gonna spend that money better or is it the 349,000 families that are spending Social Security tax? So I appreciate that, thank you. Are there any further questions to the presentation? We're gonna have a full conversation with our um, opinions about this uh, at the uh, kind of when it's member discussion time. Uh, Representative Davids. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to Mr. Williams. <clears throat> uh, you did a great job on your presentation here, but I get a little nervous when we start comparing Social Security to pension plans. They are very different animals. They're funded differently. They are taxed differently when the money comes out. I think you did a good job trying to explain this here, but. Like I said, I get a little nervous anytime somebody tries to compare a pension plan with, with Social Security. They're, they're very, very different, so it's kind of hard to do. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for the presentation. Um, maybe I'm a little behind on this, but if you could kind of go through the chart again on slide nine, I just kind of wanted to get a better sense, because at one point you said that Th about 31% of the benefit, I guess, is being taxed in Minnesota. And I just wanted a little bit more clarification on that or subject to tax in Minnesota. And then I kind of wanted to also better understand like of the various income brackets, who's like, who's, I guess, most subject to being taxed at the various income brackets. Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Gomez and Representative Baje. Um, so th this 5.9 billion number here is sort of the residual amount that is subject to tax. So if you kind of take that number you can go back to the slide on uh, page seven of the presentation, and you can see that that's sort of the end result here of that whole calculation. Okay. So that's of about $19 billion in the state. Um, I guess if you're sort of looking in terms of benefits, um, you know, the, the percentages in the sort of second column on slide nine sort of show you. So it's 
zero, effectively zero. It's a, it's a rounding error of people making less than $10,000 a year. 0.2% um, of the benefits taxable in Minnesota were 10 to $25,000. 6.5% from $25 to $50,000. You can sort of read through the table there. So that's sort of, of the amount that's taxable in Minnesota, that's how much is attributable to sort of each of those income slices. Um, another way to look at this, and that's why I sort of included it both, is this is of the individuals or returns that are subject to Minnesota Social Security tax. And this is sort of the distribution of individuals pay, or returns paying the tax. And that's the sort of second column in the middle there. So it, it, it sort of follows, but it's not one-to-one -one in terms of following. Um, the, the, the distribution of benefits. Okay. Representative Agbaje? Uh, I think that's all I have. Great. Um, anyone else before we move to bill presentations? All right, I'm not seeing anyone. So thank you, Mr. Williams.